a pleasure to introduce Mark Wittman to you all today. Um, Mark has been a leading thinker and writer on food matters. Uh, he's been a columnist for the New York Times for over 30 years. Many of you may have known him as the voice of the minimalist, which he did for a long time before moving on, and he's now an op-ed contributor uh, to the New York Times, and he's also a food columnist for the New York Times Magazine. Mark is the author of How to Cook Everything, How to Cook Everything Vegetarian, and the recent How to Cook Everything Fat. And I think it really hit me the degree to which Mark has infiltrated the modern American home when my techie father gave my Luddite mother an iPad, and the first app that she wanted to download was How to Cook Everything. Berkeley has been really fortunate this year to um, have Mark Bittman on its campus. He's hosted as a visiting fellow with the uh, Berkeley Food Institute. Many of you may have caught up with him with the Edible Education 101 class this spring, and we can look forward to hearing more of Mark Bittman um, with the upcoming Climate Matters video series which will also feature Esplan's very own Claire Clemens. Uh, we're um, kind of excited that in true Esplan spirit, Mark is wanting to have a dialogue with us, and so the way this is gonna work is I'll get the ball rolling with a question or two, and then we're gonna turn it over to the audience for, for a, uh, an hour of um, conversation with Mark Bittman about food matters. But first, I would like you to all join me in um, heartily welcoming you to Mark Bittman. It'll all come out. Okay. It'll all, it'll all. I guess in, in that case, um, Mark, one of the things that I've really admired about your work is that you've highlighted both the social justice, the environmental, and the health dimensions of food, but at the same time really empowered people to um, make better food choices through your recipes. Um, one thing that's, I, I think, been discussed a lot is that not everyone has the socioeconomic potential to do all of those suggestions. So. If a modern American family, uh, modern American individual has a $150 food budget per week, but many of us are on the lower end of that. There's a substantial number at $50 a week, and there's also people at the higher end of about $300. If if those three choices were your food budgets, what what would your menu look like, and um, what decisions or what um, considerations would inform those choices? Um. I can't write you a menu on the spot. <laughs> or like what, what I probably you could, so? but I, you know, it might take a little while. But here's, here's what I think is important. <clears throat> we don't have a working definition of the word food. If we had a working definition of the word food, this would be much easier, because um, then you could say eat food. Um, so let's just try, let's start with a little working definition of the word food, and then we'll try to do a couple of rules and um, that was fast. Um, then we'll try to do a couple of rules based on what food is, and then we can talk about economics. Um, so the dictionary says that food provides nutrition, basically, anything that provides nutrition. Uh, nutrition is something that encourages health. We have things being sold as food that come closer to the definition of poison than they do to the definition of food, because poison is something that makes you ill. So if we define food as something nutritious and therefore something that provides health, we can eliminate 20 or 40 or 60 or maybe even 80% of the stuff that's sold at the supermarkets as saying, these things are not food. Now from that, you can do policy that's really amazing policy, because you can now say we're doing food policy and we know what food is. And these things aren't food, so we're going to discourage the consumption of them as best we can. And these things are food, so we're going to encourage the consumption of them as best we can because we know, if we know nothing else, we know that we want people to eat nutritiously. If we know nothing else. So the two rules that can, so that's, that would all be, those would all be policy issues if there were anyone working on food policy, but of course there isn't. I mean, there are academics working on food policy, there are journalists working on food policy, but sadly there's hardly anyone in government working on food policy. 
But okay, we'll put that aside for a second. So what do individuals do? Individuals say, okay, I'm defining food thusly. Food is nutritious. I judge, use your own judgment. I mean, look at science. It's in flux. We don't know precisely what's nutritious. There are arguments about fat. There are arguments about sodium. There are arguments about carbohydrates. All these arguments have two sides. Both sides have, an argu you know, have some sense to be made. Um, so, but let's just say we can all agree, for example, that soda and Skittles are not part of a nutritious diet. Doesn't mean you never eat them, but you're gonna say, okay, let's get rid of this stuff. We'll put it in a different place that's not food, it's treats or whatever we wanna call it. Um, it's not part of our regular diet. So I think that in a way is step one. We take the stuff that's not food and we either wholesalely or categorically or to some extent reject it. Then we say, okay, what do we do with the rest of this stuff that's here, which is actual food? And I think the one thing that pretty much everyone will agree upon is that we need to eat more foods from the plant kingdom. So that doesn't mean to say we need to be vegans. It doesn't mean to say that we need to eat organically or locally. It just means to say that as Americans, our diets have become skewed in a way that's less than ideal. <clears throat> and that it would be closer to ideal if there were more vegetables. So there's a spectrum. There's the supersize meat diet on one side, and there's your crazy Aunt Pat who eats only carrots and celery on the other side. Um, I actually know a guy whose name is Pat. Um, he's, not, he's no one's aunt. But, um, he does eat mostly carrots and celery. He's really, really skinny, um, as you can imagine. So you don't want to be Pat and you don't want to be Morgan Spurlock. You want to be, we all are, somebody in between. But the idea is that we move from the supersized meat junk food diet towards the celery and carrot diet without any intention of getting to the place where we only eat celery and carrots. So these rules are independent of budget. This is not to say that it's not easier for someone who has a, say, $300 a week food budget to achieve a good diet than for someone who has a $50 a week food budget, but if a person has a $50 a week food budget who hears this message and takes it to heart can integrate some of these principles into his or her diet. Now, that doesn't address food justice, that doesn't address social justice, that doesn't address inequality. I don't mean to give the impression that those are not important issues because I believe that they are. But from a purely eating perspective, this is the way to deal with that. Purely eating. I'm not talking about subsidies. I'm not talking about policies. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm saying, here's how to eat. And then if you're on the wealthier end of that spectrum and you want to start worrying about whether food is organic or whether food is local or how fresh it is or how perfect it is, um, whether you want to eat truffles every day, those are decisions you can make when you have a lot of money. When you don't have a lot of money, those decisions may not be part of your decision-making tree. But the first two things, less junk and more plants, those are with anyone, within anyone's abilities. Great. Thank you very much. Can you get a show of hands with questions? <laughs> right. You're standing in the hallway. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Um, I've seen a couple of hands tentatively raising. Is there anyone with a question for ah, Carrie? Um, so just following up on that, do you, in your opinion, what is the like primary policy that you could imagine would be adapted to help people on the lower end of the budget spectrum move along towards the more Well, I think there, you know, anything is easy if you have power. If you give me the power to fix this, I could fix this. But even President Obama doesn't have the power. The best thing the Obama administration did, has done in its entire uh, stay in office since uh, in the world of food is this Healthy Hungry Feet Free Kids Act, which is sort of impossible to pronounce for some reason. It becomes a tongue twister, but we can call it HHFKA, if we can remember that. Um, 
and that improved standards for school lunches and really improved them. It proved them using existing nutritional guidelines, which existing nutritional guidelines are debatable, but they're better than the old nutritional guidelines. Um, so that really changes things. In a way, if you can imagine every kid in the country getting a nutritious lunch, you have gone a long way to not solving, but addressing these issues. And so that's a good, that's a really good step. Um, two things that I think should be high priorities. One would be to li limit the marketing of junk food to kids, because everybody knows and every study shows that dietary habits are formed very young. Um, <clears throat> and if you allow junk food marketers to sell sugar in the form of cereal, uh, or sugar candy in the form of soda, or whatever you choose to focus on, to young children, those people are going to eventually have to break those habits. Everybody in this room knows how hard it is to change your diet. Um, if children are not encouraged to eat that stuff, and they are encouraged instead to be eating and pats, celery, and carrots, they'll grow up thinking celery and carrots are okay to eat, and they'll eat them. And we, very few of us, grew up thinking that those were snacks of first choice. We grew up thinking that chips or, or tacos or pizza or whatever were snacks of first choice. Um, it goes back to the original definition of what's food. So one thing is, I think, really discourage the marketing of junk food to kids. One way to discourage the marketing of junk food to kids might be, for example, as Berkeley has done, to start taxing soda. Um, if there were bigger kinds of taxes like that that actually brought income in a big way, suppose there were a statewide soda tax or even a statewide junk food tax, and it's easy enough to define what junk is, um, you now have some money to play with. And you can use that money for a couple of interesting things. One is you can use it for developing better public health policies. You can do, use it for education. You can do what uh, with it what the money from the tobacco settlement has done. The other thing you can do with it is to subsidize fruits and vegetables instead of subsidizing junk food. And if you subsidize fruits and vegetables, you can now start to address the access problem. Because if you say, if you argue with me and say it's still difficult for people, even with your rules, it's difficult for people with no money to get fruits and vegetables because the liquor store doesn't sell fruits and vegetables and the 7-Eleven doesn't sell fruits and vegetables. This is true. But the liquor store is capable of selling fruits and vegetables, as is 7-Eleven, with the right encouragement. And if that doesn't work, there's one institution in every neighborhood that everybody can get to, and that's called a school. And it's not inconceivable that you could sell or give away fruits and vegetables in schools. It's a program that's within the imagination. It's not a practical program given the current political climate, but it's a program we can imagine effecting. And that would go a long way towards addressing these issues. Um, to eat healthy depends on water and irrigation, because a lot of the healthy crops that we eat really are grown in California, in our great valleys, or in Arizona. And so I'm kind of curious about what your opinions are in terms of this world where we have drought, and water is very scarce about, and, and water is actually highly subsidized for growing things like alfalfa and forage crops. Do you have any prescriptions or ideas about how to kind of adjust that so we have cheaper food and better food? I, I, you know, ideas are cheap and prescriptions are very difficult. So. Um, you know, there's a one-sentence answer to this, which is water policy must change. Um, I like to think um, that Governor Brown has a plan. Uh, he has some power, and he has some time, and he doesn't care what happens. He, does, he can cash in all his political capital now. We know that. Um, water policy needs to change, and we need to use water for stuff that's beneficial for the majority of people in the state and in the country. We, the United States, needs to grow more fruits and vegetables and more fruits and vegetables than even California is capable of and more fruits and vegetables 
than even California would be capable of if California agriculture were run by me. Um, it's just, it's, a, it's an amazing place, California. It's the breadbasket of the country, blah, 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 but it is not, the resources are not infinite, clearly. So even given control over the agricultural system, which no one's gonna have, we need other places in the country growing fruits and vegetables. We need other places in the country raising livestock. And we had other places in the country raising livestock, and they were called the Northeast, and they were called the Southeast, and these are places with abundant, abundant water. Water is not an issue in Wisconsin, which used to be the leading dairy state. The leading dairy state now is California. Why is the leading dairy state California? Because given the land and given the weather and given cheap water, it's the easiest place to do dairy. Given not cheap water, it's no longer the easiest place to do dairy. Wisconsin and New York and Vermont go back to being viable alternatives. We need that to happen. We also need to happen, we need, if we all ate the recommended five or nine, whatever it is now, servings of lots of fruits and vegetables that the government recommends, but does actually, but works counter to those recommendations, but that's another story. Um, uh, if we were to all eat the recommended number of fruits and vegetables, there wouldn't be enough in the United States for us all to eat. As it happens, Iowa was once a state that provided the rest of the country with a huge number of tomatoes, apples, uh, and edible fruits and vegetables, as opposed to corn and soy, which is all that's grown in Iowa now. These things can change, but it takes either market forces that I don't understand or policy changes that are not immediately forthcoming. We can talk about this stuff, and I think it's smart to have these kind of goals. Doesn't mean that they're gonna be achieved in months or even a few years, but it means we can move, we have targets. So the short answer is rational water policy is a target. Um, I was wondering what has been, in your experience, um, the hardest or most difficult argument or idea to, when you sit down to write a column, to, to get across in that format? Well, um, I don't quite know how to answer that. There is a, there's always a balancing act. Um, the job is to be fundamentally correct. Um, that is to say, it's an opinion column, but um, your opinion can't be that, it's, that the sun's not coming up tomorrow morning. So you, you first have to get the facts straight, and that is usually a challenge. And then you have to, I have to think about, and often this takes weeks or months. I mean, very few columns are written. They're all written on deadline, and they're all written in the week between the last column and the next column. But very few of them pop up as ideas on Monday and are written on Tuesday. Most of them percolate for months, and often there are themes that recur. Um, it's, hard to, it's hard to change your views because it's embarrassing, but it's an important thing to do because um, A, the science changes, and B, the opinions change. But um, I think that my views come from a pretty consistent place so that I don't encounter shifting opinions that often. I will say that the hardest columns, which is actually, which has been your question, the hardest columns, first of all, the first year or two was easy because I had a lifetime of columns thought out already. Um, and those were the plums in a way. The hardest ones now are ones that go counter to uh, the beliefs of many or some of my people I consider allies or colleagues. So. I have a always developing but fairly unpopular view of GMOs. Um, 
I mean, I think it's more scientific than that of most people, but that doesn't make it the most popular one. I have a developing and perhaps iconoclastic view of the word organic. Um, and I think, for example, the food stamp should only be allowed to purchase food as discussed and defined in the first question I answered. So those things are hard to write about because I feel like I'm tiptoeing around my friends. Um, it's really easy to alienate your enemies. They expect you to be a jerk and you don't have to, you know, you don't disappoint them. But your friends expect you to be their friends and then when you say, um, well, in theory, there's nothing wrong with genetic engineering, so what are you so hysterical about? Your friends don't like that. Um, so it just means you have a shifting group of friends. I mean, my real friends aren't defining me on my, my real friends aren't defining me on my position on genetic engineering, fortunately. Um, so I think that sort of answers your question. The mic is back there, guys. Hi. Um, so you talk to a lot of different people around the country about food issues. Um, and so I'm actually curious about what kind of questions you commonly get from people who are not academics who think about food and food systems all the time. Like what are non-academics thinking about food? What do they ask you? What are their major concerns? Well, I have been at Berkeley for the last four months, so I have spoken almost exclusively to academics. But the questions are not that different in, among non-academics. There's usually a what if I can't afford to shop at Whole Foods kind of question. Um, there's usually a question about how I function. There's usually a GMO question. Um, and there's usually a how are we going to fix this question. So, you got to come up with a better question than that if you want to distinguish academics. <laughs> no, it's just not that, and I'm not an academic really, so it's, it's, I don't, for example, if an agronomist started asking me questions, I'd be lost. Um, I'm not an agronomist. I understand a tiny little bit about agronomy and a tiny little bit about biology, a little bit about public health, a little bit about the law that affects food, a little bit about agriculture affects the environment and so on, but I'm a journalist, so I, I rely on people with depth of those fields to help me when I decide I'm trying to write about something so I don't get stuff wrong. But um, you can't ask me to go too deep, really, because I just won't be able to get there. Well, you've been in Berkeley a while, so what is the most uh, inspiring uh, thing that Berkeley has brought to you in terms of food and the most frustrating thing? Uh, well, the community's been super welcoming, uh, which is really great. And, um, you know, I've been at the Berkeley Food Institute while I've been here, and there are amazing people doing amazing things. So the ability to just, there are days when my head is exploding from how much I'm trying to absorb. Um, and you just sit down with really smart people and start talking about their field, or you start talking generally about policy. And it's just, that's the most inspiring thing. It's also, it's easier than it is elsewhere because the community is so concentrated and the city is so small. Um, it's harder because you don't know when to stop. And some days are just, like I said, my head is just exploding. That's nobody's fault, and there's nothing wrong with that. But um, the frustrating thing has nothing to do with uh, the academic community. Um, I, I think the restaurants are overrated. That's the frustrating thing. <laughs> um, and I've long thought the restaurants in San Francisco were overrated. And now I think the restaurants in Berkeley and Oakland are overrated, which is not to say they're not good. But um, with this level of farmer's markets and even this level, the level of ingredients in the Bay Area is unsurpassed, probably in the world, but certainly in the United States. Um, and to have people say, have you eaten here, have you eaten there? I just want to say, have you eaten at my house? Have you eaten at my friends' houses? Because it's really much better. So that's, 
But cooking is underrated, and these ingredients are not being taken full advantage. You go to the Ferry Plaza, I mean, all the farmers markets are good, obviously, but you go to the Ferry Plaza on Saturday morning, and you are, it's just transformational. It's an unbelievable place, and that's inspiring as hell. And the people who are shopping there, presumably, and taking stuff home to cook, those are the people who are producing great food in the Bay Area. I don't know where the microphone is, but we have hands. They're all sitting together. You can just have them pass it from one to the next. So uh, earlier you alluded to uh, the idea that when we're young is when we're um, entrenching all of our food habits. And I would uh, say further that we're also entrenching some of our environmental habits at the same time. I'm curious if you've seen uh, actual behavioral change in um, sort of adults and I guess in wider society. Uh, and if you have any success stories from, um, your, from the food world that maybe we can uh, apply as we sort of try to invoke environmental change, um, behavioral change in the wider society. I think that, I think that uh, we know that change is hard. Um, I think that if you can address people on an individual basis or on a group basis, I mean, this is why Weight Watchers sort of works. If you can address people, get them to come talk to you every week, you can change their behavior. They need support. It's not easy. Um, I don't know that that's a practical big plan, but there are pra practical big plans that incorporate nutritional or environmental advice or ways to live. I mean, we could, aside from the thing that I talked about of making fruits and vegetables more available to people and teaching people how to use them and encouraging people to learn how to cook and teaching people to cook, these are all things that will help change their lives. We could also be instituting, I mean, and I know a lot of this, a lot of this strikes me as pie in the sky, but these are not outrageous ideas, they're just not ideas that are going to be executed right now. But things do change. But we could have communal kitchens. We could have a kitchen every block. And we could have cheap meals in every neighborhood. And we could have cooking classes at those places. And we could have healthy food. And so even if people were unable to cook, on, on, they could not afford to cook well, did not have the time to cook, they could be fed well. So if the, if the answer, if the question is, how do you change behavior? The answer is you help. You have to help people do it. I don't know. There's just not a lot of circumstances in the world where you say to somebody, you should be exercising every day, and then they go exercise every day. Or you should be recycling, and then they start recycling. Or you shouldn't be wasting water, and then they don't waste water. There needs to be in carrots and sticks. I think we know this. There needs to be incentives and disincentives. And we're not really good at that, and we don't set good examples either. So, you know, you go online and you look up current dietary recommendations and you find this really cool thing called My Plate, which was thought out by smart people at USDA and in the administration, and it's the best, it's got problems, everything has problems, but it's the best representation of what a diet might look like, uh, a sensible diet might look like. And then policy doesn't support that kind of production at all. So it's completely hypocritical. Yeah, we're going to tell you that 50% of your diet should be fruits and vegetables, but we're going to pour all kinds of research and money into producing food that is not fruits and vegetables. We're going to pour all kinds of research and money and subsidies and tolerance of environmental abuse into producing corn and soy, which is going to go toward making soda, making ethanol, deep fat frying, and animal feed, all the stuff that's like not even on my plate. Um, so we need consistency. We need to be able to help people. We need home economics for growing out. We don't even have that anymore. So we need nutritional literacy. We need cooking competence. We need people to understand what food is and that they ought to be eating it. And we're not doing a very good job of that. I mean, I can say it all I want, and I probably directly, in rooms like this, directly address, I don't know, 20,000 people a year, 10,000 people a year, and then indirectly, through columns and other writing, millions of people a year, which is great. But, and I'm not a voice in the wilderness. There's a lot of other people doing the same thing. 
it's still not the same as having government programs that support what we actually think people should be doing. It's like, you can say ride share, you can say use your bike, you can say take mass transit, but until you put in carpool lanes and bike lanes and improve mass transit, no one's gonna do that stuff. And it's the same, it's all the same. You need the, you need the backing of government. That's what government's for, that's what it's supposed to be for. Okay, well, that's actually a good follow-up to that. I guess my question is, what are your thoughts on, on how do we get there? How do we, how do we communicate, how does the public, how do people community communicate to the government that this help is needed? What, what are some of the, the channels and things that, that we can do? I'm not gonna say anything surprising. And this is a perfect example of a non-academic question coming from an academic, actually. Um, there, there never comes a point in one of these discussions where these three words are not uttered campaign finance reform. How do you make change in the United States? You make change by applying pressure to politicians. I think we know this. So in part, we have to um, tell politicians what we want when it comes to food policy or environmental policy, obviously. Um, but in part, we have to have politicians who are receptive to hearing what we have to say. What seems to be increasingly clear around the country is that it's much easier to get things done on municipal levels than it is to get things done on a national level. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be working on a national level. It doesn't mean we don't care who our members of Congress are. We do and we should, but, but um, everybody who lives in the Bay Area, you know, one of the reasons I moved here is because People in New York say things like, I can't imagine living anywhere else, which to me is a failure of imagination. And people, <laughs> people who live in the Bay Area say, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. Well, why wouldn't you want to live anywhere else? Because people have worked on making, it's not, you know, it's like, well, because the weather is so good. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> San Diego, by the way, for people who live here for the weather, has better weather. Um, It's good because people have decided to try to make it better despite the, despite the statewide climate and despite the national climate. So the fact that there are bike lanes and the fact that mass transit has gotten better and the fact that you recycle even compost and blah, 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 all these seemingly little things that add up to, you know, for want of a better term, a better lifestyle, a better community. Um, it's the old think globally, act locally thing. I mean, it's so, so much of this is just, things become cliche because they're true. So, but the important thing is to work. And, and in, no matter what field you're in, uh, we all know that food affects environment, environment affects food, food affects health, health affects food, food affects labor, vice versa. This is all one big, um, I used to say skein of wool, but it turns out people under 40 don't know what a skein of wool is. Um, but it's all a house of cards. You tug on one, you take one away and the rest of them start crumbling. So whatever you start to work on, it's going to affect everything, um, as long as it's going in the right direction. There's a, sorry, you'll be next. So, I have a question. Um, we, uh, food in prisons, uh, my program, and um, we have a hard time. We can only donate it to outside organizations because we can't feed 4,000 people at San Quentin. Right. Um, we want to start advocating for healthier food in the prison system overall. And one of the ways we would like to do that is to have research available that shows that actual healthier food means better behavior and that that would increase the safety. Of the, this is kind of how you have to deal with corrections. You have to go into the, oh, it's going to make things safer if people behave better in a prison. So I'm curious about um, what research is out there that actually makes the, act, the actual correlation between healthier food and changed behavior, different behavior. So. Well, there is research out there, but I can't cite it to you off the top of my head. But you know, I'm happy to email you about it, and we can we can find what you're looking for. I think 
the other the other um, people you want to talk to is this group called the Marshall Project, which um, right. So they're doing a lot of stuff on prison food right now. Mostly they're doing stuff about how bad it is, so that's not what you're looking for, really, but. <laughs> um, I wanted to go back to what you, when, when Ron asked the question, what, what you were getting into about food and how the food in your kitchen is better than, than what you're cooking, or what, what the restaurants are cooking. So I wanted to go to a foodie question. Um, what, what are, well, I have two, okay. What are your favorite cookbooks right now, or other things that you like besides your own? And what are your favorite recipes to cook? Um, you're not gonna like these answers. <laughs> I don't really use cookbooks. I think there's four stages, I know there's four stages of cooking. I mean, you could argue there are three or there are five, but there are a few stages of cooking. And when you know how to cook, you don't need cookbooks. I mean, unless you decide you're gonna go conquer Indonesian cuisine which is a phase I went through 20 years ago. Um, you don't need cookbooks. So uh, I don't use cookbooks at this point. Um, I'm sick of them mostly because I write them, so I don't want to look at them. Um, at the same time, my cooking has gotten really, really simple, and moving here has, if anything, made it simpler. So. Um, I wrote this a few months ago, but it's really true. Dinner is usually fish and salad or pasta and salad or pasta and fish and salad or some grain instead of pasta and fish and salad or maybe a cooked vegetable and fish and salad or it's just very, it's two or three things put together from the best stuff I can grab. and. Um, you know, I can tell you that my favorite pasta recipe right now is cacio e pepe because I became obsessed by it and I'm really, really good at making it. Um, I can tell you that I make a lot of soca, which is something most people haven't heard of because if you make it a lot, you make it really well and it's fun and it's impressive. But it's just me. It's just, um, it changes, it often changes and, and I try to, I mean, the way to cook is not really to say, I prefer this or I want to cook that. The way to cook is to go to the market and say, oh my God, look at these artichokes, and then figure out what to do with them. Um, you know, wow, aren't the fava beans early this year, or whatever, let's grab them and see what we can do. And that's my style. And that's just, that's not unique to me or special, that's a mature, experienced cook style. Um, I read an article in the New York Times recently that was interesting comparing France and how in France to sort of eat everything as a social experience versus in the United States it's much more of an individual nutritional experience. But it just it brought up an interesting question I think about sort of why why and how we eat and how that relates to what we eat. And what's the question? Why and how we eat? Well, sort of like is it is it like the way that we think about how we eat as either a social experience well, or we've, an individual yeah. thing. I mean, the manufacturers, food. big food has successfully destroyed the notion that we should be eating together or even that we should be cooking at all because, mom, you're too busy to cook. And that started in the 50s and it started as a way to market canned food, frozen food, later microwave food, and then it was successful and we then saw the rise of fast food and we have been successfully marketed to death in the world of food where we think food is fuel, we have to grab it, we have to eat it on the run, it's not something social, it's not meant to enjoy, it's not meant to indulge in, um, well it is meant to indulge in, but it's not meant to indulge in in a constructive manner. And that's been a marketing plan, that is really a marketing plan. And France is going that way too, and um, unless someone stops it, it will. You know, there's a, I don't know if it's a J curve or a bell curve, but if you um, just assume there's a curve with a trough where it goes up on the other side, it's nice to think that we've seen the bottom of that curve from a 
cooking and eating perspective, we being the United States. It's even nicer to think that other countries will look at that curve and pull up short of the nadir of that graph um, and say, whoa, we don't want to go there. And so our curve looks like this, and France's curve looks like that, and maybe Taiwan's curve looks like that. I don't know. It's just a theory. But if you looked at what's happened in the United States, you might say, we really don't want our national diet to go in that direction. We really don't want 30% um, of our population to be obese and another 20%, whatever it is, 30% to be overweight. We really don't want chronic diseases to be the lead, preventable chronic diseases to be the leading killer. Um, in our country, what can we do about that? What can we do from a nutritional perspective? What can we do from a marketing perspective? What can we do from an environmental perspective? What can we do from a public policy perspective? to make sure that our citizens, our citizens and our environment are healthier. I would want to do that. I do want to do that. We're not doing that. In the same context, um, I'm not sure if you have a family or not. I don't have a family yet, but I think about how I want to raise my kids in context of what they eat. And I knew when I grew up, grew up my parents often were like, you know, you can't have sugar. And it was sort of like a treat if I like, ran an errand with them. And my friend that had a lot of candy in her drawer, she never ate candy, and I was addicted to candy. I still mm -hmm. had this sugar addiction. And sugar is really bad for you, as most of us know now, we'll process sugar, refined foods. And I know, like, recently it's been in, you know, Nature had an article about it. And so it's finally starting to come out that sugar, processed sugar is bad. But how do we, even if we tell our kids, you know, even if we have home-cooked meals, tell our kids not to eat too much processed sugar, like, how do we prevent them from going out in the world going to school, being exposed to their friend that has a thing of Oreos, and starting to become addicted to sugar in their life is sort of this constant treat that they have to have. Right, well it's not a black and white situation. This, this thing you're, this, I doubt you're as addicted to sugar as many people are. Um, <laughs> it's, there is a quantity here that's more dangerous than, I mean some is not as bad as a lot, let's put it that way. Um, I think if you do cook at home, if Kids learn by example. If you do cook at home and dessert is cut up fruit and one night a week, dessert is cake, that's a different story than not cooking at home and finishing every meal with cookies. I mean, there's a big difference, and both diets include some sugar. You know, if you want policy solutions, don't let kids walk into bodegas or corner stores or in supermarkets or whatever and buy soda. Make kids be 16 before they can buy soda without a parent. That's a policy solution. Again, very far-fetched in today's climate, but imaginable, I can imagine it happening tomorrow, and it would make an enormous change. And if that works, then you say, okay, what else is kind of in the same league as soda? Maybe nothing's as clear-cut. But what else can we sort of maybe try to keep kids from eating so much of? I like, you know, it's a good experiment. I have a question about um, your vision for the future of how we interact with food and make our decisions about it. So it seems like a general trend has been we've come from a world where we didn't have to make a lot of decisions about food and the health of it because we didn't know a lot and we've had big food industries telling us what to eat. And yeah, it wasn't so that fun. Science is uh, obviously giving us a lot of information. So now we become, can become more informed consumers. We're told what kind of diet we can eat. Every ingredient has a nutritional profile. We should remember where it came from, how far, the carbon footprint and whatnot. Information is power. We can make good decisions in theory now, but it starts to feel like perhaps this information becomes a burden where we feel guilty with every food decision because we might not be making the right one. Are we stuck with this now because it's the best we can do, or is there a future where we can imagine where we can create a food system that empowers us to kind of eat what's around and everything that's around is good. Have you thought about that kind of future? Well, you're asking about kind of edu for, you know, educating people versus changing the environment. There is such a thing as too much information. We all can get confused. And that's why I think where I started is a good, is not a bad ending place, which is to say, what's food? What do we want to eliminate from our diet? And of the stuff that we want to keep in our diet, how do we get people to eat it? I don't think you need to know whether bananas are healthier for you than carrots or vice versa. I don't think that information is necessary. 
I think you should eat both and not worry too much about it. And if you're, if you're a person who eats more bananas than carrots or a person who eats more carrots than bananas, I don't think either of you is going to become like weirdly unhealthy. Um, <laughs> you do need to know that bananas are probably better for you than tater tots and that that's a real choice, but that's not a whole hell of a lot of information. So then the question is, how do you change the environment? And um, you know, David Kessler, who was probably our best FDA commissioner of the last, well, since Edwin Koop anyway. Um, oh, he was Surgeon General. So, so David Kessler was probably the best FDA commissioner of the last 50 years. Um, David Kessler says, we're walking around in a food carnival. You walk around, the environment is eat me, and most of the stuff that's screaming eat me is not stuff you want to be eating. So that's a, that's a real problem. That's like, you know, don't take drugs, only there's a drug dealer on every corner, and the drugs are cheap and legal. So um, how do you change that environment? And the only way that I can see to change that environment is, in, is public policy. And the only way public policy is going to Move in that direction is if we agree that public health is a really, really big issue. Um, and there is no bigger issue than public health. Again, it's what society is for. So I think people can make individual decisions, but it's hard to stick to the individual decisions when the environment is begging you to eat badly. And how do you, you can't change the environment when there's a free market, which is, of course is not a free market at all. That's a completely different discussion. But when there's a so-called free market that allows the sale of all kinds of unhealthy food everywhere, not just some places, but, and not just supermarkets, which in a way would be bad enough, but everywhere, in fast food joints, on street corners, in corner stores, everywhere. There's a question up here if you want to bring the mic up here. Okay. I did have a question. I don't, I'm probably not the only one, but um, you know, it's easy to, to get excited about sort of the food movement from our perch here in Berkeley, um, probably from your previous perch in New York. You can see a lot of change and a lot of excitement. I'm wondering what your um, experience of the other regions of the U.S. that are maybe less known for being progressive around food issues. What's happening in the Southeast? What's happening in the Upper Midwest? Are you know are, are there people as excited about food as we are here in Berkeley, or how does it look different there, or is, are those places that are, are um, still in the, you know, the bottom of the J curve? Well, I, it's hard for me to speak about individual diets. It's not like I talk to that many people. Um, certainly you go to places like Oklahoma City, where I was recently, and it's hard to see out of the fast food jungle. Um, I'm sure there are co-ops, and I'm sure there are CSAs, and I'm sure there are people doing good stuff, and I'm sure there are people caring about these things. Um, you know, it's not so much policy that is making a difference here. It's, it's that it's a sort of enlightened group of people who happen to be in the same place as the best ingredients in the world, and the culture has sort of moved in that direction. Um, it's not like city or state policy particularly is causing that. You're not going to have this sort of lucky confluence of stuff in Atlanta. Um, I mean, you could have some of it, but you're not going to have all of it. You're not going to have people rushing to Atlanta because it's seen as the nicest place in the country. There can only be sort of one nicest place in the country to live. Um, so again, I mean, I hate to sound like a broken record, but you need to look at policy changes and you need to be encouraging these things. Certainly things appear to be better than they did three or four years ago, and there's some early indicators that even obesity might be going down and people might be eating a little bit better and so on, but it's not the kind of change that we need to see wholesale change, um, and we need to see it universally, and it's not going to happen in this pocket here. Well, it is going to happen in this pocket here and this pocket there, but that's tiny. We need to see it happening big. I don't know that it can happen when you have the entire Midwest devoted to growing corn and soybeans. So as long as you allow that as a sort of official policy to continue, you are producing 
you know, non-food, or Michael Pollan would call it edible food-like substances. Um, if you're producing cheap animal feed and you're producing junk food and you're producing deep fried food that's engineered to be appealing, you are not changing the food system. Until you change that stuff, you are not changing the food system. And I don't think that kind of change is gonna happen by a few people joining CSAs or shopping at co-ops or having their kids swear off McDonald's. I mean, maybe if enough people have their kids swear off McDonald's in 50 years, things change. But um, to move to a point where monoculture is replaced by uh, polyculture is sort of the big long-term goal that would affect everything, environment, health, nutrition, and so on. I don't know how, I mean, everything we've talked about is how you get there. But I don't think you get there by saying, oh yeah, there's a really good food scene in Philadelphia. It just doesn't matter that much. It doesn't even matter that much that there's a really good food scene here. We have just a few minutes left. There's a back row suite that's excited, and then. Um, you've talked quite a bit about the private sector and the, bad, the role that food companies have played as being really a negative force here. I'm wondering if you might comment on also, um, as you obviously know, there's many innovations occurring, both sort of small-scale food innovators in the private sector, um, as well as innovations by larger food businesses and, uh, and producers. And some of them just seem to be tinkering on the edge with little bits of change and not gaining um, influence. But you look at you know, like the big picture Costco's. Is that just greenwashing? Is it actually pushing the edge to change, to um, incentivize change by producers and to actually respect sustainability and some of the other issues? So I'm just wondering if you could comment on the potential that you see from sort of food entrepreneurs or farming entrepreneurs that are attempting to make a difference, but hard always to do that. Well, you asked two questions. You asked about small and you asked about big. And big only responds to pressure. The fact that McDonald's is saying they're not going to use antibiotics in chicken is a very small but decent thing. Um, and it's a response to pressure. And the fact that McDonald's is embarrassed enough to raise the pay of some of their employees at $10 an hour is a response, an in inadequate, late, but welcome response to pressure. Um, Big food has a problem because they can't respond too well. You know, what is Pepsi going to make if it doesn't make snack food? Healthy snack food? It's not going to work. Um, as far as small innovations go, I mean, everybody's waiting for the Uber of food or whatever. Um, I don't see it. I don't see that making... I see plenty of projects, model projects, that are fantastic. Cattle grazing on real pasture, um, other animals being raised in farms, even improvements to monoculture like uh, prairie strips um, or integrated pest management or rotation of crops, all of those things that, you know, the sort of beginning steps of agroecology are really great when they happen. Um, I don't think making vegan mayonnaise is that great an achievement. I don't think the other things that we're seeing coming out of Silicon Valley are shaking things up. I don't see a fast food chain that's setting the world on fire and really changing things. I see a lot of people who want to do that, and I think they go in with um, high hopes and high expectations and great ideals, but I think they're quickly uh, disabused of the notion that they can fix things by producing stuff better, uh, or by producing the same stuff better. We are not shopping our way out of this. We are not selling our way out of this. We are making individual choices and public policying our way out of it. And um, I don't know that that means that it's going to be good for entrepreneurs and capitalists. It might be bad for entrepreneurs and capitalists, but if it's good for the majority of the population, then that's a great thing. We have time for one last. Jenny's been patient. Well, I guess it's good. I uh, was attempting to ask a positive question <laughs> and maybe elicit a positive answer. 
Um, I'm a person that's more naturally inclined to being very pessimistic, and I've been trying this experiment of looking out for things that show um, any positive changes that I like to see. Um, so going back to the McDonald's thing, you know, there's been this announcement that 900 stores are going to be closing, and yes, that's a small number, but in the article I was reading, it cited a study um, where they interviewed a bunch of millennials, basically asked them about their food preferences, and they seem to think that millennials are kind of driving that because they seem to be, um, and I say they because I kind of don't really put myself in that category, but um, they seem to be going away from eating fast food um, and kind of trying to uh, promote business that's still, I guess, somewhat like fast food. So the, the other brands they were talking about are things like Five Guys or other um, national chains that are like thought of as being maybe a little bit more high quality food. And so I was just wondering, if from your perspective, you've seen any kind of um, positive changes or anything that you're encouraged by you know, the younger generation and their actions in terms of like what a future food system could look like and even relating to you know, restaurants or fast food or whatever. I think it's positive that McDonald's is being forced to change. I think it'd be more positive if McDonald's went out of business or really changed big time. As I said, I don't see anything taking its place. I mean, I suppose a more expensive, higher quality burger is a nice thing. Um, and if people ate fewer of those and ate them less frequently, that would be a good thing. I don't know that that's um, what's happening. Th there are some innovative fast food places coming online. Um, whether they're run by millennials or caused by millennials, I don't know. They're caused by a desire for people to find the next McDonald's. Um, I think that fast food will get better. I don't think it's the answer, but I think it'll get better. Anyway, I guess we're set. Thank you. Thank you.